What's going on, everyone? You already know who this is. This is Jordan Ahisi. Uh I don't even know what to call this this particular episode, uh, but I'm joined by, obviously, you know who this man is. He needs no introduction. It's my guy, Banks. We don't know if this is a, a episode or, or a culture quickie, because we don't know how long this is going to be. Um, but That's man, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> That's OD, but... Um, but I, we felt like this show was necessary because of Impact Wrestling, Backslash, TNA Wrestling. Um, I don't know where to begin. I think we can kind of begin with like the fallout of, of, of Bound for Glory, I guess you can say. Um, at the end of Bound for Glory, which is Impact's largest show of the year, um, they announced that they are bringing, bra- bringing back the Total Nonstop Action brand. Um, and their first show under that TNA banner will be January 13th, Hard to Kill, Las Vegas, Nevada at the Palms. Um, I wanted to kind of get your reaction to the initial announcement first and foremost, and we can just kind of go from there. Hey, man. TNA is baby kids. We don't die. We multiply, bro. They done been TNA. They done been what? What was before? Uh, damn, I just forgot it. When they went under for a second. GFW. They was in GFW. They was Impact. Now they going back to TNA. I don't know the business acumen to get TNA back and why they lost the name. I got to actually do some research on that because I don't know how they lost the name. But to get the rights back to it. It's fire, cause listen, hey, that, your mama called the TNA, Jeff Jarrett called the TNA. I'm gonna call the TNA. I never stopped calling the TNA. You see, like I've been on here before, and the audience that have heard me talk always say that, like TNA, ain't no impact, bro. That's TNA. I I agree with you there. I think that we all kind of know know it as TNA, um, and I think over the past really six to seven years. There have just been so many trying times in the company's history from when, you know, obviously there was, you know, the era of Hogan uh, and Bischoff and Impact at that at that time, TNA Impact. Um, and they moved to Spike TV. They moved to Monday nights. I think this is like 2010. And they kind of intended to go head to head with Monday Night Raw, which hindsight is 2020 may have not been the best decision, but little by little they started making changes to the brand that weren't necessarily constructive because it didn't emphasize why people were passionate about tna they went from the six-sided ring to the four-sided ring we started seeing a bunch of older wwe guys we're not talking about kurt angle because i think kurt when kurt came in it was kind of tna's prime uh but like when Later down the line, when you started seeing Hogan and like Sting being a main eventer and then Ric Flair and then Mick Foley, it just felt like they were just trying to bring all the old WWE legends to Impact or to TNA to kind of get a quick ratings grab. And I think that that was kind of like the beginning of like their their slow period. did were you were you watching during that point? Like, what am I bugging? Like, was it just a slow period for me, or was it just like was that the general consensus? Well, when you got the Hollywood blonde jabroni, Hulk Hogan there, I like Eric Bischoff, but you got too many cooks in the kitchen. No, like Sting Joker was fire. But yeah, I agree. Going back to what you you know asked me in general just now, that old six era was that golden age. Like that old four, the old six was. You couldn't tell me nothing about TNA. I was watching that more than WWE. Now, be it, I was still watching the E. But those years of TNA, that's what people still talk about to this day. And that's what made it an important promotion. And, you know, it made some underground legends and it made an overall legend being AJ Styles, who once he went up to the big time, he's still there and he still made, he's made way more money over there than he made in TNA and ROH in Japan. So when Kurt Angle went there, he was in his prime, but also they were in their prime. You got him 
that's when he was snapping. Like, you know, I'll, I don't want to do the Burt Angle joke. We done heard that before. Okay, Twitter, thank you for that. But let's just talk about him, the physicality of what he was doing over there. That's him leaving ECW, ECW, and he was like the, you know, the wrestling machine. He got the TNA, and he was just like, you know me having you MMA matches with Samoa Joe and overall great matches. Then the main event Mafia came about, which is one of the greatest factions in history, and it was fire. You got Booker T and Scott Steiner going for com- comedic. You know what I mean? They just going bar for bar with comedy. And then you got Kevin Nash who's doing the same thing as well, but then they had a serious moments, and you couldn't body that. So to see him do that, being Kurt, and then get all the titles from New Japan to TNA, you know, X Division, he had the World Heavyweight Champion. I mean, it, it was great. But again, when you bring that Hollywood blonde jabroni over there, it just, you know, it, it, it gets to that point where it's like, all right, man, it, it's Mr. Kennedy, and it's no disrespect to him, Mr. Kennedy was having a rival with Jeff Hardy. Why? You know what I mean? Willow, that was that was straight when Jeff Hardy was doing Willow. But then it had a down period. And I think wrestling in general had a down period at that point because I wasn't really watching the E. Right? When Nexus and all that was going on and John Cena was having matches with Big Show. You know what I mean? It's like, what? And then Kane got the World Heavyweight Championship and he had an arrival with Undertaker, which is fine to do that years later. But for the most part, it was just a down period for me and pro wrestling. Like, I wasn't really watching at that point. Like, I kind of took my break, 09 till 2012, 2013. Like, I still knew what was going on, obviously, but it was it was my news. Yeah. I, it's funny that you mentioned that that was your down period, because for me, it was the same thing, too. I think the one thing that kind of had me tune into TNA, even around that time, like, from time to time, was the the collapse of Jeff Hardy Um, because there was a point wrestling fans know it. I think it's probably one of the darkest days in TNA slash impact wrestling history. Uh, Sting, Jeff Hardy has, they have a main event for the world, for the world title. And this man, Jeff comes out smack and it's essentially a squash match. Now at the time, victory road is considered like impact SummerSlam, right? So imagine Jeff Hardy coming out unsober during SummerSlam. That's a big deal. And it was a big deal for the company. Uh, they were the laughing stock of wrestling for a little bit, and it took them a while to bounce back. Um, but I, I also, you know, you talked about AJ Styles. I think, and you can kind of check me if I'm wrong, do you think that, like, AJ Styles' departure from TNA was kind of like the nail in the coffin as far as their initial momentum? No. Um, I think at that point, you needed something new anyway. Like, the dude was a big fish in a small spawn, so to speak. And there's no disrespect to TNA, but it's just certain people, they are who they're going to be, and they go past the company. You feel me? It's not like football or basketball where you're bigger than the sport, but you on top of the sport balls. Like Jordan, LeBron, these these Titans in these sports. Uh, you think of football, Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes now. So you're not bigger than a sport, but when you think about that sport, you think about them. When you think about TNA, you think about AJ Styles, and you think about other names, but for the most part, AJ Styles, Kurt Angle are the first two names you go with off the top of your head just because of the perk angle jokes and then AJ Styles just being that dude. So, and then I just found out yesterday he actually had a chance to actually go to the E in 03. He had a tryout. But his wife got pregnant. You know, they got a lot of kids. And he was like, all right, TNA came about, lighter schedule, less money. But then now we see. Years later, he left Japan, went to the E. His kid's a little bit older. He made he making a lot more money, and then now he basically at the end of his career, still making a significant amount of money, lighter schedule. So it worked out perfect. Like I don't think it's too many people that have a perfect, you know, career like AJ Styles, yeah. other than Sting, and a few others. But it's just like the timing of everything that happens for them is great. But now when he left, you just need a new resurgence. I mean, 
the Broken Man Hardy stuff is what started the cinematic universe, so to speak, uh, for wrestling. Once you start doing the Broken stuff, it made TNA what it is now with the goofyism. And then now we see NXT took that as well. Because NXT was just about, you know, wrestling, wrestling. Then they started doing their storylines. So, you know, they took that from TNA. And then Broken Matt Hardy is the reason why TNA is what it is right now with the goofiness. And that's fine to do. Because that's when I started back watching. I was like, all right, this is different. You know what I mean? Matt Hardy got over with it. But now, you know. And then he was, you know, a little bit more prominent than Jeff at that point when he was doing that. So that's the only time he could ever say, you know, this is the case. So you're, would you say that kind of Matt Hardy's, because like at this time when Matt Hardy kind of introduces like the broken character, this is when TNA is in, in like their impact wrestling, right? They are still in the impact zone, I believe in Orlando. Things were slowing down. I think GFW around that time was either in inception or about to be born. Um, but Matt was kind of doing this broken gimmick. Do you think that that was like the, the beginning of the resurgence of impact? Because there was stuff going on. You had like the beat down clang, you had uh, the rising, you had Drew Galloway, uh, the original Eli Drake, who we know. Bobby Lashley. Bobby Lashley, beat down Clan. I think I mentioned beat down Clan, but yeah, EC3. You, know, you had stuff. You had EC3. You had stuff going on. EC3 was kind of like the the golden child, if you will. But um, was that the beginning of like the public kind of looking, kind of like double taking at TNA, being like, "Oh, this is still a thing. This is still happening." Yeah, because you had the older guys. So you know, again, a lot of people have taken things from them being the E. Because then we get a few with Bobby Lashley versus Drew McIntyre. Because Drew went over there. That's when he was working the Indies. He got himself in shape. He got his ball body. And then he's where he is right now. But he had that feud with Bobby Lashley over there. Because remember, Bobby Lashley was over there cooking. Like, he had a feud with Scott Steiner. He was with his uh, then-girlfriend at the time, which is, uh, what's her name? Michelle? Chris Crystal? Crystal. Yeah. yeah, she was over there, and Scott Steiner had his hilarious promos about her. Uh, so it was a resurgence because you got people like you just said, like 350, as my homeboy called him, being LA Knight. 350 over there, he was cooking at that point, he was already 55 years old. So you had these people who now are being booked to a certain degree at the E. Except for EC3, and that didn't work out well. But that's a, you know, it's it's no telling if that's politics or he's just born. Because in, even in TNA, he was kind of like born. Like, yeah, he got the look, but he could work. He decent at working, but he's not saying anything. So it, it was a lot of things that transpired that made it what it is today. And overall, probably pro wrestling in general. Because AEW does their sports entertainment. They goofy shit. But that goofy shit is beyond the circus at this point. That's a whole different conversation. But everybody has taken for TNA before, whether it be talent or whether it be story ideas like the cinematic or the, like, I call it the cutscenes. Like, you see NXT doing the cutscenes. They got that from TNA. Yeah. Yes. A, a lot of it. Because at the end of the day, it is sports entertainment. But they give their workers freedom to do whatever. And like I always say with TNA, People could talk trash. Somebody getting paid over there because I never see them do indies. I barely see any of them workers do indie jobs. I, I rarely see them do indie jobs. So they're getting cashed out. And obviously, if they're going back to TNA, they got some money coming in over there. Agree. Agree with that. I think to kind of piggyback off of what you were saying, like with Matt, with Drew, with Bobby, they kind of used impact wrestling as like their playground um to kind of get their names back up um in order to kind of like start their reintroduction back into potentially another run in the wwe because at the time there was no aew it was like wwe and then there was everybody else maybe i think ring of honor was still alive but like it once again it was not wwe but i think that even drew like his first 
external WWE world title reign was an impact. He was an impact world champion. Also, another thing to kind of talk about, like we, if you watch NXT, you see that they do the whole, the British rounds with the NXT Heritage Cup. That was an impact wrestling thing. They had the impact grand championship and they did rounds. I think it was like three to five minutes. It was treated kind of like a mid card title because the X division title, while they wanted it to be their mid card title because of just like the legacy of the X division title, like it wasn't a mid card title. It was just another world title. Because if you have guys like AJ and Samoa Joe and Christopher Daniels and Frankie Kazarian holding the belt, and these guys are considered the legit best wrestlers in the world. There's no way you can make that a mid card title. So the Impact Grand Championship influenced what NXT was doing or influence eventually what NXT is doing with the British rounds, um, at least as far as like introducing that concept into the States. Um, but moving on from kind of that era of, you know, of that, they obviously were on Spike TV, then they went to Pop TV. They had, once again, like Bobby Lashley. Then we started seeing kind of new guys come in with Moose. Uh, we saw Mike Bennett, Maria Kanellis, EC3 was still there. Um, Tyrus, I forgot his name. Somebody call my mama. He was in fact, funky. It don't matter. <laughs> um, he was there, and we started kind of seeing a more a more polished product. And then all of a sudden, we hear that TNA was up for sale for a million dollars. Do you think that like? Do you think that that was a legit thing? And if so, do you think that WWE should have bought Impact Wrestling? No. Um... Because what the catalog is worth, it's not worth a lot. Obviously, if it was $4 million. Now, because it's been a couple of years, I can't be accurate on the years, probably 10, somewhere around that. It, it, it probably went up significantly a little bit more. But for the most, the most part, they keep a TV deal. Like, people clown them and say they don't know what station they come on. They're on some station. They make it some type of endorsement money. I mean, you know, sponsorship money. So, I mean, you know, the owner is Billy Corrigan from... The Smashing Pumpkins. Shouts out to the Smashing Pumpkins. So he put his money into that. That's pocket change compared to, you know, what he makes for a show, especially back in the 90s. Now a little bit less than that, but at the same time, back in the 90s, yeah. Mm -hmm. At Grunge Rock era, you was doing very well for yourself. But, you know, for $4 million, the E didn't probably buy because what's the catalog worth? Like the app, if you want to watch it and stream it and get these subscribers, the app ain't really worth anything. The app is kind of bad still. The app been bad for like 10 years now. Or yeah. I think they started to the Impact Plus in 2014, 2015. It's still the same. So yeah. it's not really, if you buy it, you just had a catalog, but it's not really going to get you any money back. And it's not to say the company is broke. It's just you're not going to get anything back. Right. That's a fact. I mean, I'm I, my bad. I was looking up kind of, what was going on with Billy Corgan and Impact Wrestling and, and all that and what happened because there was a point in time where he was a part of the company. He became, and I guess it's a kind of a continuation of what was happening with Eric Bischoff, Hulk Hogan, and Dixie Carter, which I believe that Dixie Carter was one of the reasons why EC3 was such a, a hot heel in TNA was because there was a lot of real life heat that Dixie was getting. And because Dixie was affiliated with EC3, people did not like EC3. They felt like Dixie was kind of misleading the company, and it's like, oh, you're with Dick, you're with Dixie. All right, then we don't we don't really like you either. But yeah, like it said that he sued TNA allegedly. He sued TNA uh, due to an unpaid debt, um, and yeah, like all that. So that was then being EC3. He sued um, TNA. You said EC3 sued TNA? Is that what you're talking about? You're talking about Billy. I'm talking about Billy. Billy sued TNA. Okay, I got to watch the interview with uh, Chris Van Pelt, or whatever his name is, no disrespect. Yeah, he just did the interview recently. But moving on from then, um, moving on from like that era, because we, we go from the Jeff Jarrett era of the early 2000s with the X Division and Kurt Angle and Joe and all that, and then we go into the, tw the early 2010s 
By the way, a, a storyline from that era that doesn't get talked about enough, Aces and Eights. I feel like Aces and Eights was probably one of the best stories in wrestling, especially at that time. Um, but and who, and who would have thought Billy Ray could be a somewhat of a draw as a singles competitor? And they were doing arenas at the time. Mm-hmm. They were doing arenas and they were doing good numbers. Better than AEW. Wins. Huh? Better than AEW. And I'm not one yeah. of those people that bury AEW, but hey, man, that, that Mayweather money looking funny in the light. That, that's, a, that's offending. They, but yeah, they were doing numbers, even if it was in small markets. But moving from kind of that era, we go into 2017, and the company, T, TNA is, you know, purchased by Anthem Sports and Entertainment. And um, in addition to that, I think like around that same time or like 2017 to 2018, we see Don Callis joining on as a president or an executive vice president of Impact slash TNA. And then they kind of go on this run where they, you know, they were primarily actually based in Toronto and they were doing shows outside of, I forgot the name of the club, but like, they started getting some more knockouts. They started getting some more guys and they started kind of building around guys like Moose, guys like Sammy Callahan. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, Deanna Perrazzo was another one of the big talents from that era. Uh, but and we forgot. Also, you said unfortunately. Hey, you forgot that one said, name. Fortunately, unfortunately. <laughs> nah, man, shit. They had that one name. She had the, uh, the heavyweight title or the... Uh, Team, the Impact title, the Impact World title. Tessa, not Deanna. Tessa, that's yeah. what I was talking about. Tessa Blanchard. Yeah, that's what I'm Deanna, saying. Tessa. She was she was doing damage for a little bit, yeah. and then and then found out she was racist, and then that was that. But they well, also, also she has a bad attitude. That's the main reason. It ain't because of the racial bigotry. It's because she's hard to work with. Is what people have said. And that that's a whole thing. That's a whole show within it itself, but. Literally around that same time, because there was a point in time where Jeff Jarrett, um, Jeff Jarrett was brought back into Anthem Sports and Entertainment. At the time, he started his own another wrestling promotion called Global Force Wrestling. Um, after which, um, he actually did a merger between Impact and GFW, and lo and behold. Uh, shortly thereafter that, yeah, Don Callis and Scott Demore kind of took over the day-to-day operations of the company. And we started seeing guys like Austin Aries. We started seeing Kiara Hogan, Sue Young, Pentagon Jr., Phoenix, Brian Cage. Now, the comp- it was a little bit sketchy because the company was not even sketchy, but I think that they were just kind of on their rebuilding path at that point. And they started to stream on Twitch. They started to stream on YouTube. Um, even though it wasn't necessarily the most profitable move, do you think that this is kind of the beginning of the new resurgence? Was that kind of era? Absolutely, because you got to make a move. Again, they do smart business. You know, the presidents, the vice presidents of that company, because now it went from, like you said, Global Force Wrestling. It went from TNA, basically NWA TNA, because people forgot that the NWA title was a main title. That's because they had to deal with NWA to then being global force to impact to now being TNA. So they do smart business. So again, like I said, they baby these kids. They don't die. They multiply. They just find a way to stay here because for years, people counted them out to die because it's TNA. But at the same time, TNA is probably the biggest indie company in history. Well, second now to AEW because AEW is by far an indie company, just the way it's ran and, Again, I'm not here to bury AEW. I'm not one of these WWE marks. I watch all wrestling, but I call it spade a spade. It just is what it is. But with Impact, they do very smart business. They're ran proper. We don't hear any. Look, again, like you talked about Moose. He got with the company 2015, 2016, 2017, somewhere around that time. He's still there. Now, is he champ again? No. Is he on the main, you know what I mean, the main card? No, but he's still there. They paying people out because if it was an issue, people would have left already. 
it just with AJ Styles at that point, they couldn't make they couldn't pay him a significant amount when you know the Hollywood blonde jabroni was there and everybody else. And it's not it's not on his fault. Right. It's more so Dixie Carter and the other owners. But for what he probably was asking for, they couldn't afford it at that point because they were still mm-hmm. they was about to transition to another TV deal. And the house probably wasn't making that as much money as it was before. And then at the same time, again, if you can get an opportunity to go to Japan and better your skills, make as much money, if not more, more than likely more, even though you got to travel back and forth, you know, between the States and going to Japan, go over there and did it. And I mean, you spawn that Bullet Club shit and I'm so tired of that. But he went over there and got over. So... They they do very good business because you don't hear people burying a company at all. I've never heard anybody bury the company. The only time they talk about something is just more so when it's relating to the people that got over there in 08, 09. But otherwise, that you don't hear anybody bury the TNA. And a lot of people have nice things to say about Dixie Carter for the most part. Very true. And I think after kind of like that period of time where they were doing, where they were you know, that 2018, 2019 period, we saw like LAX, well, the new version of LAX. We Hated saw, it. Hmm? Hated it. I'm from the old school, y'all. I like, yeah, I'm, I'm a homicide in Hernandez. Man, so I, but you know, for, you know, I liked the fact that that tag team, Santana and Ortiz had that shot because they were a good tag team. I like the old LAX better, but lo and behold, they still had a lot of talent over there between the new LAX between still with Moose. Um, they had Rich Swan over there for a little bit. This is 2019 and beyond. They still had, you know, Tessa Blanchard. They had Sue Young. They had Phoenix, Brian Cage. Um, they were the first person to let, not to cut you off, they were like the first person to let Willie Mack cook. Very true. Very true. And Chris and Bay. They started, and Chris Bay. And they started, you know, doing little small moves. Like, they made Impact Plus. I think it was in 2019. They announced that OVW would serve as a developmental territory uh, in 2019. And the pandemic happened. And when the pandemic happened, they just started filming out in Nashville. And at this time, I think they were on Pursuit, which is owned by Anthem, I believe. Um... They ended up doing some pay-per-views. They ended up doing shows. And around the same time, they started having guys like Motor City Machine Guns, uh, the Good Brothers, Eric Young, come over. And mind you, some of these guys were ex WWE talents at this point. Um, Then that leads into them having a partnership with AEW. Kenny Omega comes comes to, to Impact, wins their world title, flaunts it on AEW TV, has matches with guys in Impact. Um, Christian Cage wins the title he defends it and all this other stuff but lo and behold we started kind of seeing Impact gradually make its way back into kind of its prominence and kind of its golden era and then from that you know they they obviously do partnerships with AEW, they do partnerships with New Japan they move to Access TV and we started seeing they have they started to add a lot of depth to their roster and developing people. So like now you look at the roster, Sammy Callahan is a free agent, but you had Sammy, you have Moose, you have Kenny King, you have oh my god, you have Jordan Grace, you have Deanna Perrazzo, you have Trinity, you have Mickey James, you have when he wants to sometimes Matt Cardona, you still have Rich Swan. And now they kind of come full circle and they are kind of this full promotion with depth and talent and good storylines. And it's the most accessible promotion too, because they put all their segments on YouTube now. Um, but kind of what they signed, Oh, they also signed a partnership with Dazen to distribute a certain amount of shows to certain parts of the U S South Asia, certain parts of Africa. You can also um, but, find them on YouTube. They low YouTube account. Pay like ten yeah. bucks a month. You could watch the catalog. That's probably better than Impact Plus. You could watch the catalog, and you could watch uh, TNA Live. If I'm, I mean, Impact Live. If I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. And that just makes them so much more accessible. And I feel like that has led to where we are now. I was gonna say, is there any 
comeback story that TNA reminds you of? Is there anything in any other world that you can relate TNA wrestling to? Man, if I just go down this now, your lane, I legit when I used to watch it, because, you know, being in L.A., we didn't have the Sun Network unless you was on direct TV. So it used to come on the Sun Network. Uh, we didn't have illegal cable at that, at that time. I think my mom just got the best package she could, pause, uh, and, and buy it, you feel me? So I think, you know, I just gradually, I remember gradually just going and saw TNA wrestling. I was like, what the fuck is T-? No, actually, I'll take that back. So, oh, three, I remember watching TNA wrestling because I saw the NWA title. And then I saw uh, Ron Killings, you know, K-Quick, Ron Killings was on there. I said, the fuck is K-Quick doing over here? Because I ain't seen him in WWE in a minute. So I saw him on there. And then I seen them win the title. And I was like, okay, this is different. But then 03, I didn't watch until like 04-ish. So 04, around for 04 is when I was like, oh, this is the promotion that I watched last year. Because I gradually went by Sun Network. Like, I just saw, like, fishing, and then after that, TNA came on. So I watched mm-hmm. TNA randomly. I think it was, like, on a Saturday or something like that. I said, okay, yeah, I'm tapped in instantly. Because I remember watching, like, Samoa Joe and the X Division in general. And I was like, yeah, okay, I like this. I have no idea what TNA is. Because, kids, I'm from the era of no internet. You just had to watch stuff or see a cover, and you go off that. So we didn't have, you know I mean? The internet was just starting. So I watched it and I was like, all right, mm-hmm. it, it stuck with me to this day. Like when I see the merch or I hear TNA, I immediately just mark out. And I just think about, you know, the Monsters Ball. I think about Paul. I just think about all these different matches that they had. Jeff Jarrett being like 20 time NWA title champ, mm-hmm. champ holder. So with me, it's just overall for myself personally, it's just the nostalgia factor of everything that took place around that time where, you know, I had WWE, and then now I have this TNA thing, and then I found out about ROH around that time, too. So I had, that started me 19 years later for having alternatives, even though I used to watch WCW and WWF. Right. Here's here's the one thing that I'll say, and I think I'm going to end it in the show on this note. When I look at kind of this comeback story of TNA wrestling, you know what it reminds me of? even though I'm not a fan of the team, TNA Wrestling is the New York Knicks of pro wrestling. They were this super hot, super vibrant brand, and when they were in their prime, everybody loved them, everybody wanted them to win. Then, next thing you know, they transitioned into a period where they were essentially the laughing stock of pro wrestling, similar to how the Knicks were the laughing stock of basketball. And then... As we get deeper and deeper into the history or deeper and deeper into the future and into the present, TNA, much like the Knicks, they made smart, quality moves that were going to add depth to their division but never added problems to the, rock, to the locker room. They may not be necessarily a championship team or WWE, but they have pieces in place that make them a quality product to watch and they put pieces in place that make them make them great that make them consistently good Scott Demore was talking about it uh on the Q&A uh, this past Monday on Impact's wrestling channel that Impact within the past five years they needed stability uh quality and consistency and they've been able to kind of deliver that across the board and it's kind of very reminiscent of what the Knicks have done to their roster. So I'm I'm very very excited to see where they go with TNA. I my hot take for 2024 with TNA, don't be surprised if they pick up Will Ospreay. I feel like the honeymoon period for AEW is over. I still feel like people may not want to do WWE. However, I think that Will Ospreay has an amazing opportunity to be the face of the second golden era of Impact Wrestling, if he wants to do that. I feel like they already, AEW kind of gave him too much too soon. And it's like, why do I need to go back? They, You put him against Chris Jericho at the biggest pay-per-view that y'all have. It's just like, you don't get that much higher. So I can and expect to see. And he don't rock with Omega too, though. Huh? He don't rock with Omega too, though. 
Yeah. So I think that we can see Will Ospreay. I can definitely still see Will Ospreay in TNA wrestling, but that concludes that concludes the show. Um, thanks. Thank you, bro, for coming on and talking about Impact with me since Mo won't do it. And Mo, you need to watch TNA. You need to watch Impact.